Peace hopes fade in the last hours before the deadline. Some Pentagon officials say Saddam may launch the first attack and a Supreme Court ruling that may roll back school desegregation. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rapp reporting. Good evening. Just a few hours left now before the deadline for Iraq to get out of Kuwait. Midnight Eastern U.S. time. Its efforts are fading fast. All sides are girding for war in the Middle East. Tonight, U.N. Secretary General Paris de Quellar issued one last appeal for Iraq to get out of Kuwait. Earlier, France gave up its diplomatic initiative. The French Premier said, and I quote, There is a fatal moment when one must act, and this moment, alas, has arrived. CBS News White House correspondent Wyatt Andrews begins our coverage. Wyatt? Dan, the biggest question from here is whether there will be war at exactly the midnight deadline tonight. Now, the White House insists that the president, as of now, has not made any final orders, issued any final orders as to say specifically go or don't go. But at the same time, you get a resounding no comment here if you ask the question whether the president, in his own mind, has already decided that force must be used. Early today, Mr. Bush convened his war council, including Secretaries Baker and Cheney the vice president and top advisors to discuss all diplomatic and military issues. But was there any diplomacy left to discuss? At the UN, the US and Great Britain quashed France's idea of offering a conference in exchange for an Iraqi withdrawal, only to have French Foreign Minister Roland Dumas admit it was a moot point anyway. No one in Iraq was even listening. Uh, the Iraqis are not leaving us any choice but war, unfortunately. For whatever it's worth, tonight the UN Secretary General did issue one last appeal to Baghdad and suggested flexibility on Iraq's call for a comprehensive Mideast settlement. I have every assurance, once again from the highest levels of government, that with the resolution of the present crisis, every effort will be made to address in a comprehensive manner the Arab Israeli conflict, including the Palestinian question. I pledge my, my every effort to this end. The mixed feelings within this country are reflected at the gates of the White House, with vigils and demonstrations now running around the clock. These voices of America ask the president to give peace more time. Official America answers that peace is up to Saddam. Everyone is crying out for this man to come to his senses. This is within his grip and his hands to, to choose the path of peace. As this deadline approaches, perhaps, perhaps the clearest indication of the president's mindset is that he began this day by calling two clergymen and asking for their prayers. Dan? Thanks, Wyatt. Officials at the U.S. Defense Department are watching the clock tick down. They are waiting for orders from President Bush. They are monitoring any indications that Saddam Hussein may open fire first. CBS News Defense Department correspondent David Martin is at the Pentagon this evening and has the latest. David? Dan, there are some indications Saddam Hussein plans to strike first, launching an air or missile attack before the midnight deadline expires, or shortly after the midnight, midnight deadline expires. Other officials discount that possibility, but they all believe it is no longer a question of if war starts, but how and when. Defense Secretary Cheney seemed to capture the somber mood that has fallen over Washington. It, it obviously is a moment of uh, considerable gravity for anybody who's involved in government, whether it's the president or those of us in the Defense Department or uh, the members of Congress. This much is certain. Saddam Hussein shows absolutely no intention of pulling out of Kuwait, not by midnight, not ever. We don't see any evidence that they're in any way pulling out of Kuwait. Quite the contrary, from our last briefing, the number of forces, tanks, artillery pieces, and so forth has gone up, which is certainly not consistent with uh, their withdrawal. Whether or not Saddam intends to strike first, the Iraqi military shows every sign of preparing to fight, putting its air defenses on alert, making 11th hour additions to the fortifications in Kuwait. U.S. forces, which now total 415,000, have gone on a higher state of alert. With one carrier, the Midway, already in the Persian Gulf, the Navy sent in a second, the Ranger, bringing more warplanes in closer range of their targets. Four more U.S. carriers are in the Red Sea. The Pentagon itself has gone to what it calls Threat Condition Alpha, which involves turning away tourists and, in some cases, posting armed guards outside offices. 
To give you some idea of the level of tension here, Dan, there were three separate bomb scares in the building today. David Martin at the Pentagon. Saddam Hussein put up a fierce front today as the deadline approached. Iraq's army newspaper warned that U.S. forces will walk into, quote, a furnace of hell if they launch a war. The Iraqi government ordered the people of Baghdad in the streets to put on a show of fearlessness. CBS News correspondent Alan Pizzi is in Baghdad. The day of challenge was ordered to spit Iraqi defiance in America's face. Thousands of people took to the streets of Baghdad for an hour this morning in orchestrated demonstrations designed to send Saddam Hussein's message to Washington that Iraqis are willing to fight and to die rather than give up Kuwait. The marchers did what they were supposed to do. They learned to do it in kindergarten. But the ticking of the clock towards the deadline for war has brought true feelings closer to the surface. I am afraid no, no, no. No, 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 afraid uh, because uh, uh, blood, no, no. And then, the answer she was supposed to give. I, 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 I love, I love Saddam. Saddam was there in every kind of pose. Posters showed him a soldier, man of the desert, statesman, and father figure. But in a graphic illustration of how isolated Iraq has become, there were less than half a dozen pictures of Iraq's remaining friends. Some said neither that nor the enormous military force confronting Iraq mattered. Yes, we know that, but also we feel that we are strong with our people. Can and you... also we are in our country and in our, on, on our land. These people may not know much about what they really face in a war with the U.S. and its allies, but this is all they can do about it. There's no such thing as an anti-war movement here unless the government decides there is. And peace is not part of Saddam Hussein's game plan today. We are fully... The streets were almost deserted as people stayed home to prepare as best they can. All those with no choice can do is pin their hopes on the god that both sides claim is on their side. When Iraqis next see this sun, the hour for reason and peace will have gone. Alan Pezzi, CBS News, Baghdad. A raid against the forces of Saddam Hussein or hundreds of thousands of U.S. servicemen and women and their other allies in and around the Persian Gulf, the British, the French, the Egyptians. Bob Simon is with American forces in Saudi Arabia on the line hours before the deadline in the desert. Clear the pee! This did not look like a strike force that planned to pause very long. Throughout the American camp, it was a day of last-minute lifting, loading, and checking. Out of the haze of a pale winter light, Third Marine Air Wing Hornets, approaching time to pull those ribbons off the missiles. And the emotions uh, come up and down with the t as a tide. At sea, it was a damp and dismal day, a driving rain as supplies were loaded under the big guns of the old war-worn battleship Wisconsin. Victory at sea, the remake. But to achieve victory, the Americans will have to liberate Kuwait, defeat the Iraqi army, do it quickly, do it with minimal American casualties, with minimal Arab civilian casualties as well. Saddam Hussein cannot defeat this massive military machine, and he does not have to, to win the war. In Arab terms, all the Iraqi leader needs to do is survive. If he can withstand a week or two of an Allied offensive, he can declare victory without having won a single battle. In Arab terms, it's been done before. In 1982, the PLO, beaten and kicked out of Beirut, celebrated victory. They had stood up to the Israelis. They had won. There's never been a Western power confronting a local leader in the Middle East, uh, which ended in a military uh, uh, victory for the West. Saddam Hussein, the defiant leader of this armored intifada, needs no more than to go a few rounds with the Americans. And while attention is riveted on precisely when the war will begin, the far more crucial question is when it will end. Bob Simon, CBS News, Saudi Arabia. Baghdad Radio says Saddam Hussein visited his troops in Kuwait tonight to prepare them for battle. Contrary to many people's expectations, the Iraqi leader has shown no signs of wanting to veer away as the deadline approached. Correspondent Mark Phillips has a report on speculation about what might be going on in the mind of Saddam. A sobering thought has been reached by many of those trying to read Saddam Hussein's mind that he may well have concluded he has less to lose by fighting, even by fighting and losing, than he has by simply giving up now. The more you think about it, the more likely it is that he's calculated. The more you think about it, the more likely it is that he's calculated that any 
change of course at this point in time would, in his eyes, be a humiliation. It would be backing down in the front of enormous American pressure. And backing down, while not unheard of for Saddam Hussein, is not something he likes to do. He has outlasted so many uh, events, uh, other leaders, that I think he, this gives him confidence that he can do it again. A confidence traced from his origins is a tough street kid who ran away from his own family to learn radical Arab nationalism from an idolized uncle, to his days as a political assassin, the way he made his way up through the Iraqi Ba'athist party. The analysts see not a madman, but something worse. This is a judicious political calculator who is by no means irrational, but is dangerous to the extreme. From early on, this man has been obsessed uh, with dreams of glory, with the goal of becoming the preeminent strong man in the Arab world. He sees himself as another Nebuchadnezzar, the biblical Babylonian king who drove the Jews from Jerusalem, or as another Gamal Abdul Nasser, who took the Suez Canal for the Arab cause, or as Anwar Sadat, who drove the Israelis from the canal in war and won it and the Sinai back in peace. In the Arab world, one can gain honor through losing in battle. And it may well be that Saddam is calculating that the mantle of heroic leadership would be strengthened if he does have the courage to stand up to, uh, to the West. It's an attitude that dates from the Crusades and was reinforced by the recent colonial past. The word dignity is a, is a word that Saddam uses very frequently. In my view, he's got a Rodney Dangerfield complex. He wants respect. And it's an attitude forged in the brutal, often deadly game of Iraqi politics. His mindset, as, as some people have said, is, is straight out of the Godfather. That this is a, this is a sort of a mafia don who understands his own power uh, arrangements and his own principles and his own values very well, but has an, an awful difficulty relating to what goes on in the rest of the world. Defying the force arrayed against him may seem mad, but Saddam has described himself as a defiant spirit. For now, he seems to have chosen the uncertainties of war and its glories rather than the certainty of capitulation and defeat. Mark Phillips, CBS News, Washington. Still ahead on the CBS Evening News, Tom Fenton on Israeli plans to shoot back if Iraq attacks, and Bruce Morton on worry and resolve across the United States. Israeli troops shot and killed two Arabs in the occupied territories today as Palestinians rioted in protest over the killing of three PLO leaders last night in Tunis. Israel said it had nothing to do with the assassinations. Police in Tunis arrested a gunman described as a renegade bodyguard linked to the terrorist PLO faction of Abu Nudal. Israeli military commanders today warned that if Israel is attacked, it can strike back against targets anywhere in Iraq. Tom Fenton is in Tel Aviv. In a public display of normally secret information, Israel pinpointed Iraqi targets it is prepared to hit if attacked. The Air Force Chief of Staff said Israeli jets could attack missile bases in western Iraq in 30 minutes and Baghdad in less than an hour, despite the distances and technical problems. We have developed in the last several uh, months uh, the tactics and techniques and the capabilities of uh, doing it if uh, it's needed. The Israelis are clearly worried by the U.S. reluctance to coordinate battle plans. We have no promises and no coordination with the United States so far at all. Israel is relying on its own defenses, now in a high state of alert, to meet the threat of Iraqi bombers and missiles. It suspects that up to 20 of the Iraqi missiles may have chemical warheads. The Israelis have promised the U.S. they will not strike first, but are not convinced that the U.S. Air Force can do the entire job of knocking out the missiles. We are not absolutely sure that uh, they can do it good as we can do it because we are more experienced and uh, we might see Israeli airplanes flying over after the Americans will try. As the Israelis wait tonight for a possible Iraqi attack, there are fears that Israeli and American warplanes may end up in the same airspace. The Israelis have an urgent message for America. Unless the U.S. agrees to more coordination, Israeli and American pilots might accidentally shoot each other down. Tom Fenton, CBS News, Tel Aviv.
President Bush is counting on the Soviets as part of the coalition against Iraq. Against that backdrop, Soviet troops stepped up their pressure on the pro-freedom movements of the Baltic states today. In Latvia, Communist Party leaders called a rally to promote a takeover by a pro-Kremlin committee. Latvian leaders predicted a military assault against their elected government, similar to what happened over the weekend in Lithuania. Gorbachev named a new Soviet foreign minister today to succeed Edward Shevardnadze. He is Alexander Besmertnik, the current ambassador to the United States. President Bush had a spokesman say that he respects and can work with the man. Stay with us now for more news, including Rita Braver, on a U.S. Supreme Court decision that could roll back desegregation in many schools. Will we go to war with Iraq? Dan Rather joins Charles Carrollt and Leslie Stahl as the deadline expires on a special edition of America Tonight. Across the land today, in the wake of vanishing hope for peace in the Persian Gulf, there was, of course, a growing sense of concern. Support for our troops, worry about our troops. The terrible hands of the clock moved toward midnight, and Bruce Morton measured this fateful day in our continuing coverage of Countdown to Confrontation. Flag raising, the Presidio, San Francisco, 6 a.m. Only hours left till the U.N. deadline. I have a lot of friends over there in the desert, and um, I don't believe in the war, but I believe in going out and supporting them. 7 a.m., anti-war demonstrators outside San Francisco's federal building. 8 a.m., the flag goes up aboard the minesweeper Gallant. It's, uh, it's do or die time. Young boy never dreamed that he'd be going to war. 8.45, end of an all-night anti-war vigil in Washington, D.C. At a press conference a few minutes later, tributes to a peace-loving man. For this is the birthday of the late Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., a champion of peace. Getting on for 9 o'clock, commuter time in New York's Grand Central Station. Only about 15 hours now. Oh, we wide open for a lot of terrorism. There's no way that you can predict what's going to happen. You, you think I think that's the scariest thing about it. We don't want another one of those black walls in, in Washington. Like the power. On it. Junior high school starts in Des Moines, Iowa, but the kids are outside protesting the war. School starts in West Palm Beach, Florida. The kids are wearing red, white, and blue. It's scary. It's pretty scary. I mean, noticing that lives could be destroyed and people could be dead. Almost 10 o'clock, Times Square, New York. 13-year-old Molly Suggs has skipped school to protest the war. About 14 hours now. 12 noon, bells ring in many churches in Los Angeles and New York. The House of Representatives opens with a prayer. Especially this day do we pray for our president and all the leaders of the nations. At the Silver Star Barbershop in downtown Atlanta, Barber Gus Jordan worries about the president, too. I don't see how in the world he could have gotten any sleep last night or even tonight. You know, wondering whether or not he doing the right thing. One o'clock, the First Baptist Church in Washington. Prayers for a son. We pray for our son, Greg. We pray for them all. About the same time, on the campus of the University of Illinois, students burn a homemade Iraqi flag. At the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, they burn George Bush in effigy. <laughs> Afternoon, anti-war protesters block the Bay Bridge connecting Oakland and San Francisco. It's the first time that's been closed since the earthquake. And across America, the sun sets. This short winter day has been full of worries and prayers and protests. No one knows what the next sunrise may bring. Bruce Morton, CBS News, Washington. And that's the news from our world tonight. As we leave you for now, hours before the midnight Eastern U.S. time deadline for Iraq to get out of Kuwait, there are many scenarios for how a war could start, very few scenarios at the moment for preventing one. There is always a chance for a last-minute move away from war, but for now, the clock ticks, the world waits. Consistent with our hope of being a steady, reliable, dependable source of information for you, and to try to help you put this into perspective, Charles Kuralt, Leslie Stahl, and I will be here immediately after your late local news this evening with a special one-hour edition of America Tonight. 
Dan Rather for the CBS Evening News. I'll see you later, right after your late local news. This is CBS. Nine on TV8. Now, a special hour-long edition of America Tonight. The deadline is here. Are we a half hour from war? Will Iraq move first? We'll go live to Israel, Saudi Arabia, Baghdad, the Pentagon, the White House, and Amman, Jordan. A new report pinpoints likely Iraqi terrorist targets in the United States. Warnings are already spreading across the nation. And new waves of dissent as the war deadline arrives. From CBS News, this is America Tonight. With Dan Rather and Charles Carroll in New York and Leslie Stahl in Washington. Good evening. The minutes are ticking away. Midnight is the time appointed by the world for Iraq to leave Kuwait. And as far as we can tell, not one of the 545,000 Iraqi soldiers in that little country has budged. So now they face 680,000 U.S. and allied troops authorized by the U.N. to attack any time after the next few minutes have passed. We will be here with you to see the deadline come and go. The diplomats are talked out, exhausted and despairing after doing their best. Western ambassadors have left Baghdad for their safety. And tonight, Iraq's ambassador to the United States, Mohammed al mashat left Washington. We do not want war. We have said it time again. We will not be the first one to attack at all. We are only the defending ourselves. But if we are attacked, then God knows where the, flame, where the flame will reach. God knows where the flame will reach. Whether or not Iraq's insistence that it won't strike first can be believed, the sand is running out of the hourglass now to the midnight deadline. High alert in the sand on both sides of the line across Saudi Arabia and its desert. Important to note that President Bush has not said he's decided to strike. If and when the President does give the order to use force, it would go through the chain of command at the U.S. Defense Department where David Martin is watching and waiting and has the latest for us now. David? Dan, there are no signs of any unusual activity here as this deadline approaches, but that's not surprising because midnight here is 8 a.m. in the Persian Gulf, and I think it's very unlikely that the U.S. would decide to strike during daylight hours because the pilots of those first aircraft over Iraq will be counting very heavily on the cover of darkness. Now, it's always possible for Saddam Hussein to decide to, to strike first as soon as this deadline expires. But as, I think as far as the United States is concerned, it will be a, another 10 hours till darkness comes again and conditions are right. Thanks, David. Uh, Bob Simon is standing by in uh, Saudi Arabia now with the U.S. forces there. Uh, any doubt in your mind, uh, Bob, that uh, there's yes. about to be a war? I have program. Hello, Bob Simon. Then the midnight deadline is 8 in the morning here, and that's just minutes away. And I never knew that it could be so chilling in the desert. The mood here is, is very ominous and very expectant, Saudi and... Kuwaiti officials report all sorts of, of rumors that the war will start in 12 hours and 36 hours. I don't set much store in any of them, but the overwhelming feeling here is that it will start soon, that the political advantages for President Bush in starting it soon by far outweigh the military disadvantages in starting it that soon. The armed forces, the forces on the ground may not be at their full peak yet, but the Air Force is ready to strike. and and there's very little doubt that they will do so. The, there were reports also that the, the Air Force was especially, especially busy overnight, that they were flying out of all their bases up and down the, the Saudi coast just to keep the Iraqis on edge. The sense here is that the Iraqi war aims will be to hit the th three things that they know America cares about. They'll want to cause massive American casualties, they'll want to hit the Saudi refineries, they'll want to hit Israel. And the awful thing from the American point of view is that they may be able to do these things and in fact win the war from their point of view without ever having won a single battle. From the American side, what the Americans have to do in this as the, the deadline approaches, the aims become 
even more daunting. The Americans have to achieve such a delicate balance that it's very difficult to see how they can accomplish it all. The Americans not only have to defeat the Iraqi army and, and liberate Kuwait, so to speak, but they have to do it very quickly. They have to do it without causing, without inflicting massive civilian casualties that would lead to, a, to an, an awful situation in the Arab world if the Americans did that. They have to do it, of course, without, without suffering heavy American casualties as without awful political consequences in the United States. And they have to do it, they have to diminish Iraq without destroying Iraq, without demolishing Iraq. No one in this region wants to see Iraq come out of this without any power at all. Charles? Dan, as we know, uh, folks in Tel Aviv have been issued uh, gas masks. Let's uh, go there now and ask Tom Fenton whether he sees any sign of them on this fateful night. Tom? Well, Charles, the Israelis are expecting the, uh, or prepared for the worst, I should say, and, and hoping it won't happen, but they fear that the Iraqis may not wait to be attacked by the coalition in the Gulf and may launch a strike against Israel preemptively in an attempt to turn this into an Arab-Israeli war. So they're prepared. Tom, uh, uh, could you see any sign of, uh, of uh, fear? Uh, the Israelis are not notoriously fearful people. Uh, were, were people getting out of town last night? No, on the contrary, this country has been surprisingly calm. None of that somber mood I hear described in other capitals. Uh, everyone, or almost everyone, has been issued a little box. I've got one here at my feet that contains a gas mask and a syringe with atropine in it. It's uh, an antidote to uh, nerve gas. Uh, everybody has been instructed in how to uh, take cover and what to do in case of a chemical warfare attack. And the Israelis have just announced that the schools will all be closed until Sunday. But no, uh, there's, there's no panic. And in fact, one of the odd things is that hundreds of Soviet immigrants continue to arrive here. More than 400 Soviet Jews flew in yesterday and they were immediately given gas masks and hundreds more are expected to arrive today. Tom Fenton in Tel Aviv. Thanks. Leslie? Charles, Iraq declared today that a furnace of hell awaits anyone trying to dislodge its 545,000 troops from Kuwait. Is Saddam Hussein preparing for a preemptive strike? Joining us, Congressman Les Aspen, Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. Congressman, what do you know about the possibility that uh, Saddam Hussein will strike Israel before we launch any kind of attack at all? I think that might be a strategy. I think it might be a very smart strategy from Saddam Hussein's standpoint. Strike Israel and strike Israel only. That means that the retaliation which comes from the United States and we hope at that point would come from our Arab allies would look like we're going to war to save Israel and that would put the Arab allies in a very tough spot. Let me ask you if, if you have a sense of how much warning we, we'd get. I understand that our intelligence over the missiles that they would launch to uh, attack Israel is pretty good. Uh, what kind of warning yeah, would we get? The, the, the missiles that the Iraqis have are liquid-fueled missiles, not solid fuel, liquid fuel, which means that you takes about two, three, four, five, six hours at a time to, to load them and get them ready. So if you see them uh, coming up and loading up the missiles and fueling up the missiles, you right. should get warning. Now, that doesn't mean that they might not have some fully fueled missiles hiding under a bridge somewhere. It's a very dangerous thing to do, but Saddam Hussein is not particularly concerned about the safety of his soldiers. The surprise attack could come if they had so liquid-fueled missiles already fueled up, hiding under a bridge. We don't know up. whether they do or not. We do not know whether they do or not. But if they use the, so the normal missiles on the launching pads, we would have several hours of warning. Okay. Do you have any sense that our military people are working on an assumption that he would launch a preemptive strike in I the don't next day think, or so? I don't think they have a presumption one way or the other. Okay. What, uh, what about uh, our attacking? What about the timetable that you know or think B President Bush is working under here in his own mind? I, I don't know, and nobody knows. Um, only very few people know, President Bush and a few people around him. Um, my guess is that, uh, uh, that that uh, what they said at the beginning of the show uh, uh, from Saudi Arabia was correct, that it's unlikely to happen during daylight hours. It might not happen for a couple of days yet. One, one indicator is that the French National Assembly is meeting to endorse the use of force by the French forces, and they're meeting on Thursday. That might postpone it till Friday. 
Um, but, but, tell but we're me talking th in the next few days, I believe. Next few days. The president keeps saying, or the White House keeps saying, sooner rather than later.